is Julia Hopkins of Northeastern University, and her talk is on like adapting urban coastlines to climate change using models to understand the potential and pitfalls of nature-based solutions. I haven't seen Julia yet, but um, the floor is yours. Awesome. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to get you started with a little bit of exciting news about nature-based solutions in urban environments, and then a little bit of uh, complications that come along with that. I'm going to be talking about coastal adaptation, potentially using nature-based solutions in urban areas for climate resilience. And when I talk about this, I'm mainly focusing on two aspects of climate change that you can see in the images to the left behind me. The first one on the top is a projection of the flooding in Boston owing to sea level rise. Uh, one of those projections. We'll figure out which one later. And then the bottom three, you have flooding that's occurring right now in Boston because of storms, which are likely to become even more intense in the future owing to climate change. So urban areas pose a particular challenge for this kind of resilience, especially using nature-based solutions, because of the limited geographic space that you have, because a lot of tend to live there. So what can we do? Well, the images on the right-hand side show a couple of suggestions. The first, some sort of maybe vegetated solution, some sort of natural solution that could help to provide some flood resilience to these communities. And the one on the bottom is a wall. Okay, fair enough, that might work. But augmented with some sort of natural element to create some kind of co-benefit. So it's not just useful when the storm hits. Now, the framework that I'm going to be using today is familiar to us from yesterday, which are just the three options for adaptation to climate change. You have the first, which is protect, so an infrastructure solution of some sort that just keeps the water out. And I say just, it's a bit more complicated than that, but like a seawall. A seawall placed properly at the right height might do the job for a little while. And then we have the idea that we might be able to accommodate. So if instead we think about living with the water, accepting the fact that things are gonna flood occasionally or maybe even all the time. We can think about designing around that. For instance, evacuation routes that help to get large amounts of people out of harm's way might be somewhat useful. Also, buildings that are safe to fail or infrastructure that's safe to fail that's placed, in a, for instance, on a second floor or third floor of a building so that when the first floor floods or the basement floods, you don't take all the power out with it. Potential for accommodation. And then finally, there's this aspect of retreat which again, hardest one to talk about, especially when you're thinking about urban areas, because most of the places that I study already have a housing crunch. So you're gonna go in and you're gonna maybe buy people out and maybe give them fair market value for their house or even higher than that, but then where are they supposed to go? Definitely a more complicated problem. So today I'm really gonna be focusing on the first two, protecting and adapting to climate change. Ideally using this idea of nature-based solutions, looking at how we might be able to use models to understand the potential for nature-based solutions in an urban harbor. So before I go into the model itself, I should probably define what a nature-based solution is. This is a kind of a vague term. For today, what I mean is any sort of nature-inspired or infrastructure that uses natural elements to provide some sort of protection against either surge or waves. Now, nature-based solutions come in many different forms not all are appropriate for every area including every urban area but i've listed a couple of them up here we have sandy solutions that include things like dunes with dune grass planted on top that helps to protect the land from the ocean we have things like living shorelines or mangroves both of which provide some sort of vegetation barrier again between the ocean and the land we have things like reef structures, which provide some sort of benthic roughness, which can help to take energy out from a storm as it approaches an urban area, for instance. We also have other things like seawalls that are, again, augmented with some sort of natural element to make them a little less, you know, destructive to the view and a little less destructive to the ecology that happens in that particular urban space. Urban areas still do, in fact, have some sort of environment. And then we also have some new solutions, including floating wetlands, which can, again, provide some kind of barrier between the ocean and the land, but floating wetlands don't necessarily take up space on the land, which in an urban area where you have a lot of people 
is somewhat desirable. So when I talk about using these in models, how do we tend to do that now in coastal hydrodynamic models? I work in the land of coastal engineering where we use models that combine things like waves and currents and surge and wind and storm tracks. We tend to simulate these things over relatively short time periods, so just over a storm's duration, to look at things like flooding and wave attack and damages. In these models in particular, most of these nature-based solutions right now effectively get shoved in as a roughness element. And the reasons for that are because the models tend to have resolutions of about, you know, five meters or 10 meters at the finest. That's sort of for computational efficiency to understand where the water is going. And so we have things like vegetation and reef structures that you can put into a model as effectively an enhanced friction element to take energy out of the flow. We have things like seawalls, which are just usually walls. That's usually fairly simple in a model. We have things like sand, which, as mentioned yesterday, can be very complicated. As you all know, it can be very, very complicated. It's not just a roughness element. You also move it. You also put it on places. It can also be a barrier. But it's also something that's relatively, relatively well studied, even if we don't fully understand it just yet. And then mangroves, which are not applicable to us right now at this latitude, but have been studied to provide a bunch of benefits. And for mangroves in particular, we're starting to be able to model them potentially at the root structure of the system, which is rather cool. But today, the nature-based solution modeling I'm focused on will be around my home in Boston. So I'm not going to look at mangroves. I just can't. They're not going to grow there. We're going to instead be looking at other types of vegetated solutions. So this is Boston on the left-hand side. This is just a snapshot of the Boston Harbor. You can see that little red pin up there is Boston proper. And Boston is an interesting place for a couple of reasons. It's an active harbor. A lot of the economic value comes in through a dredge navigation channel that's north of all the islands that leads from the ocean to Boston proper. But when a storm hits, Boston itself is not usually exposed to wave attack. All of those little harbor islands that dot the area that you can see there tend to protect the inner harbor of Boston from large storm waves. So when we think about resilience for Boston in storms, in climate change, what we're really thinking about is resilience from sea level rise and from surge. Why might surge be a problem? Well, the image to the right-hand side shows what Boston looked like in the 1600s, and that's the dark green, and what Boston looks like now, which is the light green. You can see that most of Boston is just built on fill, so a lot of it is at sea level, including Logan Airport, which is that little structure with all the lovely geometric white lines, which happens to be a major corridor in and out of the northeast of the United States. So we can't ignore that this is some high-value property. So. We now know what Boston's vulnerabilities are. I'm going to zoom into Boston proper. We're going to acknowledge the harbor is there, but not really focus on it just for right now. And I'm going to drive home the idea that Boston has some significant vulnerability when it comes to storm surge. This is a map that was generated by a consultant group that the city of Boston hired just to show what storm surge might look like if different categories of hurricanes hit Boston. And again, you can see all the low-lying areas basically flooded. A bathtub model would probably get you something like this. Boston's vulnerability, though, is a bit more complex than just where the low-lying areas are, right? It's a city, so it's also where the people are. So this is just from the census from 2020. This is a map of environmental justice populations in Boston, to the best of our knowledge at the moment. And you can see that areas of Boston have a lot of minority communities, low-income communities, immigrant communities, communities that don't necessarily have the resources to hire a consulting company to get that plan to figure out how they're going to protect their particular stretch of land from a storm, or communities that can't just go and build their own seawall, which some other affluent communities actually are doing in certain parts of the Northeast. So when I consider the vulnerability of Boston, I'm looking at modeling not just the waves and the surge and the tides, but I'm also looking at focusing my analysis on areas like you can see in the dark green and dark blues where we have environmental justice communities that may not otherwise be able to have this kind of result. The model itself, it's a Del 3D flexible mesh model. You can see the bathymetry of the model on the left-hand side of the screen, where deep colors are deep water and warm colors are basically land. The model resolves down to about 10 meters in the Boston Harbor proper. And for this particular demonstration, I'm running one storm in 2018, hurricane, not a hurricane, storm, winter storm, Grayson. The reason we're running Grayson is because, one, it flooded a lot of Boston. All of the images to the right-hand side are floods from Boston. The aquarium's on the top, and then East Boston's on the bottom, looking across the channel to Boston proper. And two, 
is one of the storms we actually have anecdotal evidence of where the flooding happened, which is not necessarily normal because one of the other things about the Boston Harbor is there's not a lot of actual data, which is kind of interesting, right? So we're running this storm, we're running the floods owing to surge and owing to tides. There are waves in there, but they never really get into the harbor. And what we see when we just run the storm as it was, hindcast effectively, is this type of flood map. So again, we're focusing on Boston. You can see Boston proper, you can see Logan Airport, you can see all of the white is the land that didn't flood, and then all of the blue inside of the black is the land that did flood. And we do have, notably, a lot of flooding around an environmental justice population in Chelsea, Massachusetts. So the flooding that we mapped in our model does map to anecdotal evidence from Grayson and also somewhat corresponds to a FEMA flood projection map just based on sea level rise and where the elevation is. But this particular image on the right-hand side is a bit instructive because not only is it FEMA's map for flooding, all of those polygons indicate areas where residences aren't, but industry is. And I'm actually going to leverage that a little bit. So I'm going to rerun Hurricane Grace and I'm going to run it with a couple of different solutions, nature-based and not nature-based, basically to see what the potential might be. I'm going to do a barrier because sure, why not? That's gonna, probably gonna work, we hope. If it doesn't, then we have other problems. Is it ideal? No, but it might get the job done. I'm going to also run vegetation. Notably, I'm putting vegetation where the people aren't. I am taking up industrial land, but I'd prefer to see if the extent of land I have to me that doesn't involve displacing people is enough to have any sort of significant impact on the surge. That's the test. And then, of course, the orange in this image on the right-hand side is going to be the reef structures. It extends much further down the channel than you can see in this image. It's any sort of benthic elements so with a lot of roughness. And it's on either side of the dredge channel, because again, Boston is an active port, and getting people to put things inside the dredge channel might be a political non-starter, we'll have to see. So basically, the question is, given the givens of where we might be able to site things, is there any potential for vegetation and reefs? So let's start with the barrier. We're going to now look at the flood map. Now with the barrier, you can see the flooding is basically gone. Well done. Let's take the barrier away. Let's put some vegetation in. What happens? The answer is more than you'd expect, honestly. The surge actually is reduced in Chelsea, and I have a figure in the next slide that we show you by how much, but the surge is actually reduced just by taking up industrial land, taking out all the pavement and shoving in vegetation instead. That's pretty good, there's some promise there. The reef structure, I'm just gonna spoil it for you now, did absolutely nothing. So we're not gonna look at that particular figure. So, if I then add the question of sea level rise, to the simulation, we get an interesting picture. So in this figure, on the x-axis, we have sea level rise from various IPCC reports. On the y-axis, we have the flooded area in Chelsea. The blue dots are if we have no intervention whatsoever, nothing happened. Gray dots, barriers, and then green dots, vegetation. And we can see this is the entire area of Chelsea report is worth being flooded. So we can see that when there's no sea level rise, gray and green, do better than blue. But everything starts to get more flooded as you get more sea level, even if I put a barrier around the entirety of Chelsea's waterfront. What's going on there? Well, I want to draw your attention to this other line in this very light figure, which is the city limits of Chelsea. I kept my barrier within the municipal boundaries of Chelsea because usually some of these projects operate on municipal level. So if you only look from municipality to municipality and you don't have cross-governance, it's very possible the water's just gonna come around. Even if you put a barrier around the entirety of Chelsea, so in the land as well, you just create a lovely little bathtub for all of the rain. So that's a complication right there. You need to be looking at solutions that cross government boundaries. Another complication, and now for some data. I said there wasn't any data in the Boston Harbor. Well, there wasn't until February of 2024 when my lab deployed wave buoys in the harbor at the locations you can see here. We wanted to see if the assumption that no waves penetrate the harbor is actually real. For some complexity, I'm now going to go from outside of the harbor, inside of the harbor, and we're going to look on the x-axis at time and y-axis at wave height. We're going to have model in red and data in black, and there's your model data comparison for those of you who are wondering how well the model might be working. And we're going to see that during a particular storm, light storm, in March of 2024, we have some waves outside of the Boston Harbor. Gets to about 1.3 meters-ish. You can see a tidal signal too, that's quite nice. Now, if we move into the harbor, we look at Spectral Island, so this buoy right in the center, the waves are going down, they get to about 50 centimeters. And again, model and data tend to agree that's very nice. 
But if we move to the buoy that's in the innermost part of the harbor, we see the data is actually showing waves that are significantly higher than what our model says should be happening, even with wind generation turned on and things along those lines. So there's something missing here about harbor dynamics, right? We wouldn't have thought to look at wave penetration into the harbor to design nature-based solutions to protect not only against surge but also waves, unless we could see that waves are important and this data suggests they might actually be important. Slightly more complexity. The way of categorizing nature-based solutions as effectively roughness or friction elements or something along those lines is very good for the types of models we're using and in fact might be very useful for design purposes, but we don't know yet. And some investigations recently have suggested things might be a little bit more complex than we expected. For instance, a recent study at Oregon State University shows that there exist certain configurations of dune grass, which we thought were put down to anchor the dune in place and prevent it from being eroded, certain configurations that actually make the dune fail faster. That's something we need to be thinking about. And also, on the image to the right-hand side here, you see Climate Ready Boston, all of these lovely plans of everything that's going to be put in, lots of vegetation, lots of barriers for some reason, lots of bioswells. All this is very lovely and very idealized. We don't know how it talks to each other yet which is something we're going to have to think about when it comes to modeling. The geographic extent we have, the people we're going to be working with, and how everything might combine to either uplift each other and work in concert, or potentially detract from different parts of the nature-based solution landscape. So, with these thoughts, I leave you with a bunch of images of us getting data from the Boston Harbor from the first time, and I thank all of my collaborators for this work, and also all of my students. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, I mean, I think, I didn't check this with the model, but my intuition suggests that if you go from one high point to another with a barrier, you're probably good. And in Boston, if you went from Chelsea to Everett to Mel uh, Chelsea to Everett to Malden, it's just a string of towns that you have in one concert, you actually might be able to get a contiguous barrier that's high enough that you do protect against any sort of incursion of water. But that comes with its own complications, right? These are sort of like, living, breathing marshes and lots of areas that people would like to access, especially if you live nearby. Um, we also, if you're looking at a barrier for surge, that's one thing. If you're looking at a barrier for waves, that's a bit of another thing because you have that energy then being reflected back across the channel. So it's a bit of a complication as to whether or not a barrier would suffice. It probably would, but the goal of the nature-based solutions is to make some kind of more palatable option because a barrier in and of itself mostly just makes places a little bit harder to live in. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I learned recently that uh, USGS in Boston is just starting to have like watershed recalculated with in taking into account the infrastructure, like the pipes and stuff. And I found that really interesting. I wonder if you think about that in the future about, because as I understand, it's like started in Boston, like it's a new thing that are you talking to, about the pipe system, like the uh, water? Uh, to calculate like when it rains, when the water goes. Yes. Oh, that's a good point. So my models definitely didn't do precipitation, but that's definitely another bit of complexity because all of these solutions combine the surge coming into the ocean with all things being washed down from inland. And also, as we might have learned from the OSU study, groundwater might be important. There can be groundwater infiltration that happens on scales that is faster than we usually anticipate. So. Definitely when it comes to how Boston normally handles outfall and uh, rainwater, uh, it has a combined sewer outfall system, so the answer is usually badly. Um, you usually can't swim the Charles River after a big rainstorm because yeah, it's not very, not very pleasant. So uh, the, Boston still has a lot to tackle when it comes to the rain alone. Um, and also it still has a lot to tackle when it comes to any amount of flooding coming in from either the coast or inland. Yeah, and people are, it's, it's very, very strange kind of areas. So people are very interested. Other questions? Fascinating talk. Thank you. 
You showed, I believe, that vegetation reduced the flooding in mm -hmm. Chelsea, and I'm just wondering what the mechanism was. Is it just the roughness that slows down the, the, the surge? Or? Yeah, so I think it's a combination of roughness and also preferential pathways for water, right? So if you have a place where water can move onto, but it's very friction heavy and it doesn't really want to go, it's going to go a bit further upstream. And we've been trying to track the budget of the water as to where it's going on either side of the channel. So it's possible that it was displaced from just that area to another part of the channel itself, which is something to consider, right? Because that means another area is getting flooded. I would guess that storm lasted long enough to reach some steady state, or was it, do you think there's a delay effect? That if the storm had lasted longer, would that roughness have not done the same? It's possible, yeah. And that's one thing that's an interesting question, which is, you know, storms, as they last longer, as sort of storms move up and the systems are not as fast, that's definitely going to have an in, a different impact than sort of your typical one day or one and a half day long peaks in the storm. But also, you know, sequence of storms. Like if you have a storm, then immediately another storm, and then immediately another storm, oh, yeah. you know, that's probably going to have a different impact than if you have a couple in isolation in terms of the flooding and damages. So that's a very good question and something that I hope to explore. Thank you. All right. Thank you.